Hi there, and welcome to the final part of our series looking at abiding in Jesus. My name is Dan, and I'm one of the pastors here at HTBB, and I'm really excited about looking at this passage today in John chapter 6 that I think has an amazing promise and wisdom for us as we navigate this season. When I was at university, I was in a band, I know, cool, huh? And uh, at our penultimate gig, everyone left, like everyone. By the interval, they had all gone. No one stayed, not even the barman who was paid to be present. Now, to be fair, there had been a double booking at the club and the audience had come and paid to hear a very different kind of music. If I'd have been them, I'd have probably left too, but it still hurt. Now, fortunately, I take some solace that I'm in good company. In our reading today, Jesus starts the chapter with about 20,000 followers. And by the end of the same chapter, he's left with just 12. Actually, scrap that. Judas is now making his plans to betray Jesus. He has 11 followers remaining. Outwardly, Jesus' influence is wasting away. But inwardly, and importantly, in his core team, where it's really going to matter, he is being strengthened because his disciples are being taught what it means to abide with him, to remain in him. And importantly, what it means to abide with Jesus in a time of lack and loss. And as I was preparing this, I kept being reminded of a verse from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, And I think this is a promise for us to receive for ourselves today. He writes this, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And in our reading that we're going to focus on, we see this promise play out in the life of Jesus and in the life of his disciples, and therefore how it can play out in our lives today. That in this season, when we feel that we are lacking, the season that outwardly we are wasting away, physically, socially, financially, and emotionally, when Jesus is present, even this can be turned so that inwardly we are renewed day by day. And I don't know about you, but I need renewing day by day. So this is John chapter six, John chapter six, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing those who were ill. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside, sat down with his disciples, the Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where where should we buy bread for all these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, well, it it would take more than half a year's wages to buy even enough bread for one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go amongst so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they'd all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Amen. One of the things I find really encouraging about this story is that Jesus doesn't waste hard situations, but uses them to grow us. In fact, it often seems he intentionally leads his disciples into them. So if you find yourself in a tricky conversation at work or, or a challenging time in your family struggling because of our current situation, know that Jesus hasn't abandoned you. In fact, he's using this to renew you. And this is one of the ways he does it, that seeing this massive hungry crowd, Jesus asks his friend Philip a question, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? 
He asked it, so I need to test him. Sneaky. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. Now, by test, it doesn't mean pass, fail. It means to reveal what's in his heart and then strengthen him. True testing results in strengthening. And the way Jesus does it is to make Philip face up to the lack. And he does this because worry about lack is one of our biggest barriers to abiding in Jesus and to obeying Jesus. On a recent gap between movement restrictions, we took our kids out on a day trip. It was about a 30-minute drive, and both kids fell asleep in the back of the car. When we arrived, we couldn't find a place to park as everyone was seizing the opportunity just to get out. And so we were driving in circles looking for a parking space when one of the kids woke up and started asking over and over in a more and more frantic voice, where are we going to park? But where are we going to park? And I was like, kid, like you have contributed nothing to this day trip. And until a minute ago, you were fast asleep. You really don't need to worry. Just sit there in your car seat. Abide with me, if you like. I've got this. And Kay and I were laughing, but to be honest, this is just an unfiltered picture of me. When I become aware that in some area I'm lacking, abiding and obeying suddenly become a lot harder. When when lack is the loudest voice in my life, it becomes the controlling voice in my life. And the temptation is to either panic or abdicate, or often both. In Philip's response, you see the temptation to panic. It it would take more than half a year's wages to buy even enough bread for one to have a bite. And in the other accounts of the same story, you see the temptation to abdicate. The disciples say, send the crowds away, Go, go to another village and buy food for themselves. I wonder, what do you feel like you are lacking in at the moment? Money, time, empathy, ability? I think that what we can see here is that Jesus gets us to look at our lack, to be honest about it, because it's here when we look at our lack and we feel overwhelmed that he can teach us to not need to panic nor to abdicate, because this is the promise. The promise is he will provide for you. And even more excitingly, he will provide for others through you. He's teaching us to hear, look, I've got this. Abide with me. So let's look at those two promises. Jesus says, I will provide for you. You don't need to panic. In times of lack, he's teaching us to abide, to receive. And the image to keep in mind here is of the disciples eating their lunch. We read in verse 12 that they all had enough to eat. I don't know about you, but when I start to feel like I'm lacking, it's abiding with Jesus, spending time with him. That's the first thing that I'm tempted to cut. Cut the Bible, cut prayer, cut being still, just work, work, work. Like, but, but actually, those are the things that I need to be in the most of those moments. By staying near to Jesus, listening to Jesus, obeying Jesus and receiving from Jesus. In other words, abiding with him. The disciples each got what they needed. And the key thing is, the choice isn't to abide or not to abide. The choice is, what are you going to abide in? Something that satisfies or something that leaves you empty? Because actually, I think abiding actually comes quite naturally to all of us, but it's easier to abide in the negative things. Catastrophizing is a form of abiding. Doom scrolling, that is a form of abiding. Panic is a form of abiding. Like Philip, these are all ways of abiding in the problem, but not the solution. Become aware of the problem at the expense of our awareness of his presence. And Jesus goes on to unpack what this sign of the multiplication of the bread means later in the chapter. Uh, And he says, look, there are loads of places you can abide, but I'm the only place that will satisfy. These are his words to them. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it's not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They say, okay, then give it to us. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. It's an incredible claim. Every other religious leader and teacher points away from themselves to God. But Jesus points to himself. And this is a claim to be God. 
And he starts by setting himself up as a, a new Moses, which to us probably doesn't initially mean much. But for the original hearers, Moses was the one who taught them the way to live, the truth to live by and gave them their life and their identity. So what Jesus is saying to us is wherever you get your way, your truth, your life and your identity, if it's good, as Moses was good, then it was just preparing you for the real thing, the true bread. And if it's not good, if it leaves you hungry, then it reveals the longing that is only satisfied in him. Jesus is saying, I am the one who satisfies. This is the claim that our, our freedom is found in Jesus, our joy is found in Jesus, our healing, our identity, our peace, whatever you have a longing for at this moment, articulated or not, Jesus is claiming to be the food where you will find your satisfaction as you abide in him. And this is a brilliant image because the way we feed on him is not willpower. As Kate said last week, I can't just try and have more faith or try to be more patient. And this is why that, that last bit of the reading, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, we drew again to a mountain by himself. Because in the same way you can't force others to change, you can't force yourself to change either. It's really not about willpower. It's, you know, willpower is like, okay, like the other day, one of our kids properly smacked the other in the head, like wound up, released and floored her sister. And I, I went to tell her off and she looked at me with these big, enormous eyes and said, I am a good girl. I won't hit her again. I won't hit her ever. Lovely sentiment, lasted about 30 seconds. That is the voice of the flesh, alluring, often convincing, but it doesn't work. Instead, this is how Jesus says we change. In verse 63, he says, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. Putting this into practice, this is why the Bible is so important to us as followers of Jesus, because his words to us are life. Every word that comes to us from God carries his presence. And in his presence, there is life, resurrection life, bringing dead things, hopeless things, joyless things back to life. Without his words, we are dead in the water. But with his words active in our life, we become more alive than we could ever have imagined. Like, I think about it. I was, I was really trying to work out what would have been the right way for Philip to answer Jesus' questions. What, what could he have said? Because instead of focusing on the logistical impossibility of Jesus' question, Philip could have said, well, Jesus, well, I don't know, but I've seen you heal someone who's ill who was, and someone else who was paralyzed. I've seen you turn water into the best wine we've ever tasted. So I don't know where we can buy it, but I've seen enough to know it's something to do with you. But like Philip, we're forgetful. One of the main lessons we learn in reading the Old Testament is that we forget to remember. But as we read the Bible, we encounter him afresh. And as Jesus has just said, these words are full of life. I mean, just in John, like the first miracle is too much wine. This miracle is too much bread. And the final miracle is too much fish. Like he is a God of provision and abundance. But I forget that. And I need his word to remind me. What is also great about this image is that often one of the barriers to reading the Bible is it can feel intimidating because we don't always understand everything in it. But the image Jesus uses here isn't students in a lecture hall. It's a regular people eating lunch. Do you know what? You don't have to understand how a meal is cooked or how your body digests it for it to nourish you. And it's the same with the Bible. Of course, we want to seek to understand it, but the Spirit of God isn't limited by our understanding. And as you read his word, you will encounter him. You will receive life. This is basically what we see with the disciples. They see something, they don't understand it. They ask Jesus, he tries to explain it to them, and slowly they grow. But the order is faith seeking understanding, not I understand and therefore now I have faith. Simply reading his word will bring life to us. That is the mystery, encouragement and joy. But there's also a challenge here. And the challenge is that we 
are the limiting factor. Read this. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. Jesus has as much for you as you want. There were, there were 12 baskets left over. He, he's not run out, but they are full. And as you abide in him, especially in the challenging times, you'll receive all that you need. Like the disciples, you'll get your lunch. But there is also another challenge here. And this leads us into the second promise of Jesus. The challenge is that often our greatest need is not our most presenting need. If we look at that verse again, Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven. It's my father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. In one sentence, Jesus reframes the giver, the gift and the grandeur of his generosity. They're thinking we want a God to send a leader who will give us political freedom to Israel. And Jesus saying, no, it's God himself who is going to give you eternal life offered to the entire world. Look, the things of this world do have significance, but they are passing away. So spend your life on the things that last, which leads us to the second promise. Yes, we abide to receive, but we also abide to give. He promises to provide what you need, but he also promises to provide what others need through you. And the image to keep in mind is this from verse 12. When they all had enough to eat, the disciples have eaten their fill and so has everyone else. He said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets. I think humans have this inbuilt heightened awareness of lack. Um, at dinner the other day, one of my daughters, uh, she hadn't been eating her food. And also, apologies, all my stories about my children, but I literally haven't seen anyone else. So um, anyway, we're at dinner and uh, she hadn't been eating. And so I picked up one of her chips and I said, can I have a chip? And she looked at me and then took the chip off me, selected a smaller chip, broke off the end and then offered me a tiny crust. Like, what an image of how I am with Jesus. Everything she has comes from her parents. And yet when I ask for a tiny portion from her, from her leftovers, she feels the need to withhold. When you are being asked to give and you're feeling the tug of lack on your heart, the image to remember is that of the disciples, each there, bewildered, standing there holding a basket full of bread. Like, what what am I supposed to do with this? It, this totally dismisses our fears in this area that make us want to abdicate and run away from any opportunity of giving, that I don't have enough and that I am not enough. He removes that barrier of I don't have enough. And he doesn't do it by saying, sure you do, you know, try harder. Like you've got it in you. He does it by performing a miracle. And the silly thing about Philip's panic reply of think how much it would cost is it kind of misses the point. Because it's it's not hard, it's impossible. Like even if he had the money, where are you going to find a bakery in the desert with 20,000 spare roti ready to go? Like the problem with Philip's reply is not that he's pragmatic, it's that he's not pragmatic enough. Maybe that's why he's not known as pragmatic Phil in the way that Thomas got known as Doubting Thomas. I always feel sorry for Doubting Thomas. Like the others had did fell over as well, but he gets named as that. Like, and I'm so glad my conversations with Jesus aren't recorded for posterity. Anyway, pragmatic Phil isn't pragmatic enough. It's not hard. It's impossible. I often think this with preaching. I, I can't even describe the aroma of coffee. How on earth am I supposed to describe to you the living God? But as in obedience, men and women preach, God makes himself known. Jesus doesn't explain this miracle and how it's done. Because the point isn't the mechanics, the point is he is the Messiah. And he's saying, abide in me. It's kind of a theme all the way through John's gospel. There is just this obsession with people trying to work out how Jesus is going to do what Jesus has said he'll do. He makes these amazing promises. And instead of going, yes, please, they say, so how? 
You're going to give me living water, but you've got no bucket. You're going to feed them, but you've got no money. You're going to heal me, but I can't get to the pool. You say be born again, but I can't get back into the womb. You say you came from heaven, but we know your mum and dad. You say Lazarus come out, but oh, he's been in there four days. He's going to smell, Lord. And you know how sensitive my nose is. You've watched me try and take a COVID test. When we feel that we don't have enough and need to give up, think of the disciples standing there, holding the basket full of bread. As we give, he gives back, and not just back to us, but he gives abundantly more to us than we had in the first place. But he doesn't just remove this barrier of, I don't have enough. He also, importantly, removes the giving barrier of, I am not enough. Look, we're told that there are 5,000 men there. That's besides the women and children, because perhaps that day they didn't count the women or children. And Jesus multiplies a boy's lunch to feed them all. Therefore, he provides for them through the gift of someone who wasn't counted. But he used this child because this child counted to Jesus. They didn't count him, but he did. You count to Jesus. He wants to give to others through what he has already given to you. And these two things are so important to remember when a challenge comes to us. So often it's fear of these two things that stop us stepping up into a situation that needs our leadership, like a ricky, really tricky conversation that needs to be had or a hurdle that seems impossible to overcome in our, in our marriage or workplace. And remembering this gives you the confidence to step in knowing that Jesus will do something. We may not understand, we might not know what he will do, but he's promised to do something. Often when we feel, I am not enough, we look for other areas where we feel enough to give our attention to. One guy said to me, it's way easier to win at work than to win at home. So when I'm struggling to be a good dad and a good husband, I retreat and dig in at the office. When you are abiding in Jesus, you are enough. It means we don't have to step out, but we can step in. The disciples get their lunch and an abundance of leftover, a basket each. He has fish sandwiches for you and he wants to create food banks through you, literal and figurative. In Jesus, I will have enough. And in in Jesus, I am enough. But also Jesus teaches us here three really helpful principles that shape how we give. Firstly, we see that Jesus prefers to give relationally. In verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, the word sit down here is to recline. This is the traditional way that you would sit in a small group at a dinner party where you recline on each other in small circles. It's the word used at the Last Supper for how John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, reclines on Jesus. It's friendly. It's intimate. Jesus doesn't just want to give things to people. He's using this to build community too. And you guys do this so well. There there are some connect groups I know that have been uh, supporting people financially during this time. But they, they give relationally, not just here's money, because money on its own rarely solves problems. It's being done relationally. Secondly, we see that the Lord loves to include us. He doesn't need us, but he loves to use us. We, we heard, I just heard this remarkable story this other week from a, a member of the congregation. She was the first to become a Christian in her family, and other members have been coming to faith through her, but there is this one auntie who has not only been really resistant and hostile, but has also held others in the family back from exploring uh, faith in Jesus too. And so she's been praying for her auntie, but didn't dare bring Faith up with her again. And then the other day, out of the blue, no warning, she gets this WhatsApp from her auntie. And so she's usually slightly scared of reading them. So she psyched herself up and the message said, would you come and tell your grandmother about the gospel? We are becoming Christians and I want you to come and tell her how good Jesus is. Right? How amazing is that? And how wonderful is that? The Holy Spirit has been at work in her family. and doesn't need her, but he loves to include her. And she has the opportunity now to go and share with her grandmother how good Jesus is. So when we give, look to include others so that they can give too, because this is what Jesus does. Something that's really helpful to understand here is that when we give, in a way, is us giving, 
But in another way, it is Jesus giving. We belong to Jesus. We are part of his church and he's generous. He is very generous with his church and he gives his church away to the world. You don't see Jesus asking the boy for his lunch. He takes it because it already belongs to him. And also because he knows that this boy, as he gives, will receive way more than he had in the first place. When we give, it is Jesus that is giving us away to the world because he is generous, which makes it easier to give. But also leads us to the third way to give, which is to give with thanksgiving. It's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus gives thanks before the miracle happens. We read, he took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. Things are not sorted, and yet he gave thanks. And this is hard, but even crazier is that on the night Jesus was betrayed, Jesus also took the bread and gave thanks. If he can give thanks in the face of the cross, then we can learn to give thanks in the face of anything that we are facing. But it's also a massive encouragement, because if as you give, it's actually Jesus giving through you, giving you away, then it also stands that as he does that, he gives thanks to the Father for you before you do it too. How amazing is that? When you give, Jesus is giving thanks for you. He praises his Father in heaven because of you. And I just want to echo that thanksgiving and say a massive thank you for all that you do as a church. It's been so encouraging to watch how generous you've been in the face of this crisis because of your gifts of time and money. As a church, we've been able to continue and even grow our ability to serve our neighbours. You know, since the beginning of the lockdown, we've had 943 guests through Alpha. That's amazing uh, because you've given of your time. We've been able to support over 185 families through the food bank because of your giving. And that's what we've been doing together. But I keep hearing these amazing stories of what people have been doing in their own neighborhoods. Evelyn, who takes food personally to this home in her neighborhood, funded by her and a group of friends. Or, or Mia, a biomed student who's been making cakes and giving away the profits to the food banks. People who've also been volunteering with Crest, putting themselves on the front line to care for those who need it most. I'm so grateful to be part of this community. You're so inspiring. And what we see here is that Jesus is grateful. He gives thanks when you give to. But learning this is hard. This is a challenging season. This is a pruning season. But Jesus never asks us to do anything that he's not willing to do or go through himself. This passage details, as Kate spoke about last week, Jesus is pruning. Remember, at the beginning, Jesus has 20,000 followers. At the end of the chapter, we read this. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. See, this is the key moment. Outwardly, Jesus looks like he's wasting away, but inwardly he is being renewed because his team are now on board. And each and every one of us is watching this today because that team were taught to abide and out of that gave their lives so that we could hear the message of Jesus. As the saying goes, you can count the pips in an apple, but you can't count the apples in a pip. Outwardly, Jesus has lost the thousands, but inwardly, he's got his disciples to the point where they're able to abide and so reach the world. And this is the place where Jesus is trying to lead each and every one of us to, in the good times and the bad, because as we come to him, we will find everything that we need. See, the key moment of this story is not when the disciples realize their lack or when they robbed the kid of his lunch. The turning point is when they gave it to Jesus. Jesus is the one who makes us enough. And he doesn't just want our lunch. He wants our lives. Amen. And so we're going to pray and invite him to come and fill us afresh now. 
And as we're doing that, if you would like somebody to pray for you one-on-one, -on -one, you can uh, just press uh, in the chat bar now on the side. And one of our team would love uh, to pray for you as you request prayer. But let's invite the Holy Spirit to come. Holy Spirit, we love you. We love what you do, the way that you do it. We ask that you would come wherever we are now. Come and fill us afresh. Come, Holy Spirit. 